thing is taking its time. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Oh, there it is. All right, great. Uh, all right, take two. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us for the second installment of the Spring Anti-Racism Lecture Series. Um, we are delighted to have Professor Nisa Jean from our nursing department. Um, we're really excited to have her speak about uh, racism um, in healthcare. And so this has been a topic that we've been discussing internally with the planning members uh, for quite some time and kind of moving away from some of the traditional, um, I guess, uh, discussed topics. Um, not that they're not important, but some topics that kind of given COVID, given where we are, um, that we want to pay some attention to. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Jean now to get things started and, um, um, and do her thing. Thank you so much, Abdul and um, Colleen, for inviting me. Thank you, everyone who has um, joined me today. Um, I, I am actually pleased to hear that this has actually been something you guys have been talking about. Um, I definitely look forward to um, hearing more about what's been coming up in your discussion as I start to present some of the things that, um, you know, happening on the nursing front and the healthcare front as it pertains to race um, in healthcare. Um, so I, I do have a short presentation that I did prepare. So I'm going to go ahead and share that with you now. Um, and just keep in mind that um, I can't necessarily see you guys when I'm in presentation mode. So if there's anything that you want to add or anything that comes up, feel free to unmute yourself and um, just chime in. I'll definitely leave um, space and um, room for you to do that. So in my attempt to just lead this discussion, and I hope that it is a discussion because I definitely want to hear from uh, those of you who have joined me today, I think it's very helpful to um, see what the experience is um, for all people as they engage the healthcare um, system. So in my attempt to lead this discussion, I thought it would be very helpful to kind of just develop some questions that will help guide us and lay the foundation for a constructive conversation. Because sometimes when we talk about race, um, it's, it's a challenge, it's a challenging um, subject to discuss because of just the nature of race. Um, but um, we wanna make sure that the conversations that we have remain constructive and on a positive note. Um, so, you know, many situations in our healthcare system leads us on the path of discussing race. It is, it's in our face. We, we see it every day as we watch the media, as we look at um, different images on, in our news, um, you know, in our television shows, uh, race is a very prevalent um, concern and issue for us all. And it has definitely been uh, a huge, had a huge impact on the healthcare system um, and how people of color just experience the healthcare system. So some questions I'd like for us to just consider like, why do we need to discuss race in healthcare? Um, and then what are some barriers to discussing race? Uh, and also we wanna look at just, you know, are we teaching or taught how to discuss race? Because that, again, it's a very challenging um, conversation to have, um, but we need to be taught to engage in constructive dialogue as it pertains to race. And then how can we have those constructive um, conversations about race and ethnicity in a way that we learn from each other and we're able to grow as a society and move beyond some of the stains of our past? Um, so I think that is kind of like where I'd like to go today and sort of like, you know, have the discussion. Um, but again, I know everyone on this call or everyone that may be listening to this, do not share my perspective as a faculty member, some of your staff, um, there may be some students who are joining us. So again, I'd love to just hear um, your experience as it pertains to this topic. So first, 
um, why do we need to discuss race in healthcare? Um, and you know, this his, we have a huge history. And if there's something that's popping up in the chat that um, you know, because I hear the the bells chiming, just feel free to unmute and, and chime in. Um, Historically, we have seen prejudices against minorities, specifically African American, and particularly in this in this culture. So um, we know that you know racism exists, and it just exists based on where we've come from, right? Um, as we transitioned in our society from having um, a a culture that accepted the um, the enslavement of um, human beings, African Americans, into a society that um, identified, you know, human rights and basic rights, and um, the fact that everyone deserves those basic rights. Um, there's been some, you know, we've come a long way. We've come a long way as it pertains to that discussion, but it took us a while to get to where we are today. Right? We're talking about thousands of years of um, some of those beliefs in terms of you know, those individuals from specific ethnic minorities, such as African-Americans, as being um, less than or inferior than or different from, right? Like not even seen as human. Um, and there's remnants of some of that still existing in our society today. Uh, the two reports that I've identified on this, sli on this slide, the 1985 Heckler Report from the Department of Health and Human Services and the 2002 Unequal Treatment Study that the IOM, now the National Academy of Medicine, um, uh, conducted really just um, helped us to identify some of those disparities that we see in our healthcare as it pertains to race and ethnicity. Um, and up until then, there was very little research done um, in the, for the benefit of African Americans in particular. Um, most, the, the um, most common participation of African Americans in science and in healthcare was usually not something that was consented. Um, in the past, it was something that um, was uh, done just as like sort of uh, dissection and experimentation with certain procedures and demonstration of certain procedures, but it wasn't done um, for the benefit of African-Americans. It was really done out of curiosity. And we have a lot of undoing um, as that pertains to um, addressing some of the problems and addressing some of the racism that we see in our healthcare system today. Um, this is one of the reasons why we uh, deal with um, mistrust of healthcare professions or healthcare professionals um, within uh, certain you know, ethnic communities like African-Americans. It's not just African-Americans experiencing this type of um, uh, mistrust. Um, you know, we see it among certain Hispanic cultures. We see it among certain um, uh, Asian cultures. So it's not something unique to African-Americans, but this is something that is, it impacts this particular culture in a way that plays out in some of the disparities that we see. Now, we have several healthcare disparities in our society. And those and disparities are just those differences that we see in our health outcomes um, as, it, as we look at different cultures and as we look at different uh, races of groups of people. So in particular, we know that African-Americans tend to um, uh, not necessarily live as long as their white counterparts. Now, not to say that we've, we've come a long way with that because we've seen advances in our healthcare system that has increased the life expectancy for all people, but it has not necessarily been something uh, that uh, has been equally shared among all races. 
So we see some disparities in terms of life expectancy. One of the most profound disparities that we see is our maternal um, child morbidity and mortality rates. African-American women have mortality rates three times higher than that of their white counterparts. And in many cases, this is adjusted for certain things like access to care, right? Because you would assume, oh, well, is this person going to seek medical care or prenatal care? Um, adjusting for all of that, access to care, um, prenatal care, um, age, socioeconomics, right? So even educated African-American women still um, have a higher incidence of maternal mortality and maternal morbidity than their white counterparts. So these are some of the most profound disparities that we still see in our healthcare system today. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. And what we try to figure out is, you know, in many cases, culture is a protective factor for, for many people. Um, but in many cases for the African-American community, it's a risk factor, right? So when we see, um, you know, people from different cultures, they, uh, they have certain traditions that may um, uh, be health related um, in terms of, you know, practices, religion, food. Um, and, and in many cases, this is a protective thing. We like culture. We want to be delivering culturally um, uh, competent and culturally appropriate care to our patients. But in, uh, in the case of African Americans, it is seen um, by many providers as a risk factor, um, which is a problem, which is a problem. So we are doing a lot about this in terms of these disparities. There's a lot going on. Um, and before we get into, I'll just say what we're doing about this for the end as we kind of look at some of the other issues. Um, uh, because I think it's just really helpful to recognize that, you know, since the 1985 Heckler Report and the 2002 Unequal Treatment Report, a lot of policy changes have been made a lot of changes have been made to practice settings. Um, in a lot of changes have been made in terms of medical education. A lot of changes have been made in terms of uh, nursing education. So um, we are definitely moving in a good direction, but unfortunately, um, you know, we still th these problems still exist in 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 these communities. Um, so let's move on. So some of the challenges that we note when we're talking about race in terms of barriers, um, these conversations sometimes are uncomfortable, right? They are, um, you know, for the most part, conversations, especially when the, um, you know, the provider does not share the same cultural background or share the same ethnicity of the uh, patient. Sometimes, you know, uh, people fear um, not sounding like um, they understand or fear that they're going to offend their patient or fear that, um, you know, uh, the question or the inquiry will seem um, uh, invasive. Um, but these conversations are uncomfortable, but they have to be had, right? And not everyone is taught how to have these conversations and bring these conversations up. Uh, another challenge is that they are time consuming, right? And if not asked correctly or asked in a way that is respectful, um, can cause a person to, you know, shut down or um, not necessarily want to engage um, with, you know, the questions that the provider is, is, is giving. Uh, and, you know, how we talk, how we ask these questions, how we um, sort of our level of comfort with these conversations as it pertains to race and not just race, but gender um, or ethnicity um, or any of the other um, categories that people fall into. 
Um, we have to have a, a, a constructive approach to it. So I have like listed a couple of resources here um, in terms of having these difficult conversations. This action framework is a model that um, allows people to engage in conversations in a way that is, um, is positive, is not judgmental. Um, it, it makes it okay to ask the question. It's how you ask the question, right? Are you asking the question to, um, you know, for, for, for a purpose that is positive, that is useful, that can be integrated into um, the client's care. Um, it's all in your approach. So um, it, it's, a, it's a framework that just allows people to engage in conversations or if they hear someone um, engaging in a conversation that is saying something that could offend someone, it gives, it empowers people to inquire and, and, and correct that, right? So we don't want to be bystanders when someone is offended or if someone says something that is inappropriate, especially in the classroom. Um, this allows us to, um, you know, be empowered to ask the question. Um, and then there's another model that we use. It's called the six R's of facilitating race-related discourse. And in this model, it, it kind of does the same thing as the action model. So it really just talks about, you know, and, and empowers a person and lets them know that it is okay to, um, to, to restate things, ask questions in a way that you restate it so that the person that said it, does it make sense? Um, is it disrespectful? Because most people don't intend to be disrespectful when they're inquiring about things like race or ethnicity or gender, or when we're talking to our LGBT community. Um, you know, sometimes it really is, you know, a, a, an appropriate question. But again, it's how we ask that question is really important to use. Um, so one of the other concepts that I usually introduce to my nursing students, um, because with those two reports that we talked about, we one of the highlights came out was um, that was not incorporated in medical education or in nursing education um, that is instrumental this conference that is instrumental to this conversation is implicit and explicit bias. Uh, so one of the exercises that I do with my students to help them understand what their, um, cause we all know what explicit bias is and most people feel like they kind of know themselves enough um, uh, to kind of control for their biases, but that might not always be the case. And sometimes these things need to be pointed out to us. So um, we, we use things like this prose by Claudia Ranke, who's a poet. Um, she wrote this, this poem and I would usually preface this with the students by um, saying to them, you know, for example, you are that person, um, you know, in this situation. And I just want you to think about, as I read this prose, um, I just want you to think about um, what do you think is going on here, right? From your perspective. Uh, I try to, because of the nature of bias, we all have it, you know, it's inherent. In, and, and that's also one of the things that people need to understand um, is that, you know, it's not always a bad thing. It's just what it is. It's, it's, it comes from your background. It comes from your experience. It comes from your rearing, your culture. Um, so we go through this exercise and it allows the student to, you know, and I do open it up to share and we share and we challenge by choice. I do open it up to the students to, um, you know, what do you think is going on? And it's almost amazing the the variance in terms of 
you know, solutions that or um, or the answers to that question that I get. But then just hearing student other students experience it makes people go, uh -huh, I would have never thought that. I would have never approached it that way or I would have never saw it that way. And then we just go, well, you know, no, it's no right or wrong, but it's just recognizing that your experience may be different from someone else's experience. And it actually enhances a level of their emotional intelligence um, so that they can empathize with people who may not necessarily come from their background or not be not necessarily um, come from their particular race or culture, but it just makes it very, um, makes for good dialogue, makes the conversation accessible, makes the conversation very relatable. So I find these things are, are these kind of um, tools very helpful in sort of opening up the students um, to other people's experience. Um, so how we have those constructive uh, conversation, especially as um, models and faculty and staff members um, for our students. First, we understand that, you know, although someone may have a particular prejudice, bias or belief, um, it is, um, you know, it, it's okay. It doesn't necessarily come from a bad place. It, they, they may not necessarily, and most people don't necessarily intend to offend someone. Now, some people do, but in most cases, the intention is not to offend. The, in, the intention is to inquire, and it's how we inquire and how we share those experiences really important. Again, having that emotional intelligence, being able to tap into, um, you know, uh, you know, and empathize with others um, and being able to meet people where they are, what their needs are, and just kind of build on their strengths rather than focusing on their weakness, I think is something that um, definitely kind of grows out of these conversations. Um, and then, you know, recognizing that, you know, sometimes these feelings are uncomfortable, um, but it's okay. We embrace it. It's a challenge uh, and use the use of self-reflection and, um, you know, just examining your own beliefs and your own biases. That's also something that we do with our students, uh, give them opportunities to self-reflect on their experiences it is so helpful in this journey to be able to have a constructive and productive conversation about race and ethnicity. Um, so that's really important. So I say all this to say, um, back to that question that I had in the, in one of the beginning slides is what are we doing all about? What are we doing about this issue of racism in healthcare? What are we doing about the issue of having some of these um, just really uh, huge disparities in healthcare? Um, and part of that is incorporating things like bias training for healthcare providers, for nurses, for those individuals who are engaging the public. Um, because without that, I think there is very little awareness. People don't necessarily have the awareness that the problem even exists and that they could be, you know, attributing to the problem you know, in, in, you know, not in an intentional way, but, you know, you know, in a, you know, a way that, you know, just because they're not aware of what they bring to the healthcare um, setting. Um, so including some of this training, um, making it a comfortable conversation, um, making culture something that is integrated and not just one time, right, in your, in the curriculum, but something that is integrated at every stage within the curriculum to really um, uh, provide the appropriate amount of cross-cultural training uh, that is necessary to engage, you know, the diverse population that we have, right? So we're really looking at um, you know, those individuals who fall in those um, 
uh, minority categories uh, growing, right? And we see um, about 40% of the U.S. right now is made up of someone who, um, you know, falls in one of those categories. Um, and we anticipate that to be growing. So having a, a healthcare uh, workforce that can engage those populations and help promote positive outcomes is definitely something that we're doing. Um, some other things that we're doing, we're focusing on health literacy. Health literacy is um, really about patient engagement. And this is something that um, I'm a huge proponent of because I feel like everyone um, should be able to make the best decisions for themselves. And in order for them to do that, we as healthcare providers and um, individuals engaging the public need to be able to give information in a way that people can understand it, interpret it, and then make those informed decisions. Um, the use of interpretation um, services is definitely something that we're doing and making sure that we have delivering care in um, culturally and linguistically appropriate uh, ways for the patient, right? Um, so we're focusing on things like that. We're focusing on implementing uh, standards of care. So with those maternal mortality rates that we're seeing, um, we are sort of moving it beyond the provider's uh, judgment and applying the standard of care for every patient with that particular problem. And in the past, that wasn't the case. In the past, if a provider um, you know, picked up on something or thought the patient needed something, it was within their jurisdiction to um, you know, uh, order that treatment. But now we're, we need to, because of bias, because you know, a provider may see patient A and prescribe for that particular problem, but they may see patient B and for whatever reason not prescribe, we are applying a standard of care for everybody, right? And so we're hoping to see some of those changes in our maternal mortality uh, rate and, and see some improvements there because we, ha we haven't seen much improvement there. That is actually um, one of the worst that we're seeing. Um, uh, some other things that we're doing is uh, definitely um, doing more patient teaching. We have, uh, we utilize things like Healthy People 2020. Um, we're looking at um, our social determinants of health, right? Because health does not necessarily start in the healthcare setting. Health actually starts where people live, work, and play. Um, and we have to address those environments and make sure that there's equity in those levels of the patient's experience um, so that when they engage the healthcare uh, setting, they are um, more equipped to carry out and follow those recommended um, and prescribed um, uh, treatment plans. Right. So we're looking at that and we know that, there, you know, this is not a problem that is just unique or a problem where we can intervene at just one level. This is something that we need to intervene within our healthcare system, within our education system, within, um, you know, our provider engagement as well as the individual. Right. Those communities that um are are impacted. So um, it, it's definitely something that uh, we are looking at, and um, you know, definitely collecting that information to be able to respond appropriately to address some of those disparities and make health more accessible for all people. Um, so I do have some resources for you guys. Um, one. A really important resource is that um, sort of having those um, race talks. Uh, it's time to talk and listen by um, uh, 
uh, Kim and Del Prado. Uh, it's a great sort of book for anyone who wants to engage in those conversations that are sometimes challenging um, and that, you know, usually kind of has like, you know, either polar, um, you know, experiences, uh, but it allows you to hear people and really just examine your own biases before you even approach someone else, right? Because you have to kind of, you know, uh, check in with yourself before you can, you know, address someone else. But this book is a really great resource and it'll, it, it is um, a resource that you will be journaling along, as, uh, along with as you read it. Um, and that reflecting and that self-reflection and that journaling really does help to sometimes break down our, our barriers and some, some of the fear that is around having some of those difficult conversations. Um, so, I encourage everyone to take a look at that, okay? And the other resources that I have. Um, so I'd love to hear what you guys have and what you guys think about this topic as it pertains to race and healthcare. Um, so I'll go ahead and end my share here. Hi, I see we have some new guests. Hello, hi, Yang and... Victoria and hi everybody. I don't see any other faces. Hi, Alisa. Um, this, hi. this is a great topic, and I really hold I really hold this topic dear to my heart. And at the beginning, you asked, you know, why is this important? It's very important. Usually, you know, I teach sociology of medicine, ah. and and every year, it's when we talk about race and health, and then students tend to think, well, you know. You know, if you get health insurance, they can't just say, oh, you're black, you're Latino, you don't get health insurance. And I say, it's true. I mean, if you have a job, you know, what kind of job you have, right? But usually it does, it's, it's not as obvious. But I, yeah. I believe the COVID, you know, coronavirus pandemic really, you know, magnified this issue. Because mm -hmm. when you think about, you know, the, the much higher percentage of minorities dying from uh, this uh, virus, a mm -hmm. lot, lot higher than, you know, a white community. That's something right. we need to think about, right? And yes. yeah. Very, very much it, so. Yeah, when you, when you talk about, you know, communication, it's interesting that I just posted this um, article that I got from Bro uh, Brookings Report, uh, and I posted for my students for group discussion. The title is uh, How Poor Communication Exacerbate Health Inequities and What to Do About It. Exactly, they cited studies after studies to talk about the importance of, you know, like um, communication, like training medical uh, healthcare workers who share similar racial ethnic background. Mm -hmm. Because, and also yesterday, I just listened to this powerful story from this um, uh, a Latino doctor, and she she was the first. A graduating LA that had the highest score uh, from Stanford Medical School, and um, and she uh, volunteered to go into Fresno, Central uh, California, to be emergency um, uh, doctor because she majored in emergency medicine. And she talked about <clears throat> like how many people, when they look at the doctors who look different than they are, they're not going. So I think that there's a lot of mistrust. So I thought that what you talk about is really, really powerful. And um, so thank you very much for that. Yeah, awesome. Yang, you actually mentioned a lot of things that um, are very much, um, you know, on the forefront of what we're facing in, in healthcare. Um, this, the whole conversation about social determinants, you know, access is just a piece, health insurance is just a piece of it, right? Um, and uh, even when we looked at some studies, um, people with the same health insurance, those with who are of uh, ethnic minority did receive different treatment, weren't offered certain treatment options. And, you know, I don't necessarily think that providers are intentionally doing this. I really think that many people have not necessarily tapped into their own biases and their own beliefs about specific um, ethnic groups. And, 
you know, in situations of communication where you, you know, um, aren't effectively communicating with the patient and you don't have a good history, there's sometimes taking that history is, is a huge challenge. If you don't have a clear picture, you're going to rely on some of your own assumptions of what you expect that patient to um, be or what you expect them to um, be able to do. And that's going to impact how much you share with them. Um, and, and, and I don't think they're intentionally doing that. I think it, it's just there is there's lack of time. There's lack of resources. We always need more resources. We always need more time. They are, you know, we are confined by the regulations of CMS. Um, and, you know, there's so many pieces of it that, you know, it's not a one sort of fix, you know, solution. Um, but yeah, so communication was a huge thing and health literacy, a huge thing, you know, Back in um, 2008, the IOM did a study and they talked about how health literacy was like the wonder drug, right? Patient engagement, teaching the patient, getting them to be fully in activated. We call it activated and engaged in their own health. Um, you know, I see it every day. We see it in our families. You know, we see that, you know, when patients aren't fully aware or fully um, activated to participate in their own care, they don't. And if they don't, then we see it in our health outcomes. And this is across the board. So, you know, all those things, the communication, access to care in terms of social determinants, um, you know, uh, training a, or having a health care workforce that reflects the patient. Many doctors, nurses face discrimination at work. They, we face prejudices at work, right? So it makes it very challenging for, um, you know, and we face, you know, discrimination and prejudice, not only from our colleagues, but sometimes from the patient, right? So it's really challenging to break down some of that, um, you know, some of those, those deep rooted beliefs that people may have. And, and again, that self-reflection, that bias training by far has been the, the best asset to educating, you know, nurses and doctors. And it moved us beyond just culture training, right? It, it moved us because a lot of the culture education is really sometimes promoting some of the prejudice and the racist beliefs that people have. It really just, you know, um, it really just confirms their bias, right? Because they see it in the book, and I guess that's what it is. Um, but we, we, it allowed us to kind of move beyond that, and I think it, it's just been a very wonderful um, addition to all of our curriculum. Yeah. Thank you, Aisha, for Hi. this presentation. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the access that uh, allow, uh, that give people the ability to seek for uh, um, health and uh, also the economic, the socioeconomic aspects uh, has a lot to play with. Uh, uh, stemming from the assumption, mm -hmm. the perception that uh, certain people uh, do not have the right to have certain type of uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, continues to put families into deeper and deeper uh, 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 in, in a place where the knowledge is not coming to them, the prevention, they're not able to do prevention to keep them from getting to the point where they uh, need the, the treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are so many other factors, the distrust that I will be some uh, doctors 
that is not in the uh, same culture as me, I would be a cobai for that doctor, not necessarily approaching my uh, sickness with the best intention. All mm -hmm. these fears keep people from uh, adventuring mm -hmm. and knowing more. And uh, even it has to do with their health. They relate, um, they uh, go to uh, the tradition medicine yes. that they know that is gonna bring them the relief faster than uh, when they think they don't have the money first to afford the doctor, to afford the medicine and to even travel to go to the doctor. There are so many factors that keep uh, um, people like me, uh, other people, other minority right. people to seek for the type of health that is there for uh, uh, the, their counterpart. It's mm. a more, more issue that mm. is not addressed most mm. of the time. And lastly, we sometimes have students that cannot attend class because they have either a toothache or a severe uh, illness that they cannot seek help for because they don't have the money. Their socioeconomic status doesn't allow them to get uh, uh, the money to seek for the help that they need. And even if they look for charity care, the process is so long and uh, um, in, in the process, they minimize the, the, the health of the person that some people get discouraged and rather suffer. Or I've seen students miss a semester because they wow. didn't have the health insurance to wow. uh, um, take care of their personal issue. Yeah, access is a big piece and there's so many facets as you were talking about in terms of access and um you know you know th just thinking about it with um you know COVID-19, you know, um many people although we have, you know, a vaccine that is available, even getting an appointment to get a get the um, vaccine has been a challenge. Navigating the websites has been a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we weren't really thinking about reaching those vulnerable populations, those, po those populations that may not necessarily have internet access to sign up. Um, you know, and, you know, I'm not just talking about, you know, it's ethnic minorities, it's our uh, elder population, it's our population that may not necessarily uh, seek help in the way that we do, you know. Um, so all that, you know, f definitely falls un under this category. I see a hand raised. Um, hi, Mary. I was wondering who that was. It's hi. Me. Hi. Um, wait, I have to put my mic up so you can get my, hold on. Okay. Uh, sometimes people say they can't hear me. I don't know if it's the computer or what the case is. You're, I'm good. Um, I get the uh, New York Times and the Washington Post online, um, and it just comes through my email, sometimes once a day at each, and sometimes three or four, depending on the crisis in the world. And it was most disturbing to me to see that the um, life expectancy dropped by one year, okay, but not for the minority groups. There's dropped significantly, significantly yes. more than once. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm like, oh, really? And the other that I, you know, there's good news and bad news. We have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is now going to be available, one shot instead of two, which might make it a little bit easier for some people who have a hard time getting to the centers where the vaccines are going to be given. Um, but then we also have the situation where the percentage for the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer, the percentage of, uh, of efficacy of that one is much higher. It's like 90 some percent, whereas the Johnson & Johnson is down 
74% or some such thing. And yeah. now the question is being asked, okay, um, and it's all going to be sent into these areas where they're having a hard time getting the vaccine and getting to them. I right now am in the Philadelphia area and they are opening centers and huge, huge. Okay. You know, the convention center and, and, you know, the, uh, the stadiums and everything else. And so we're talking very, very large areas that people are used to getting to and can get there by public transportation, as opposed to sending them out to the suburbs that nobody can get to if right. you don't have a car. But now what's being said is, okay, why is it that you are sending that vaccine to those areas? It seems like it's a lesser vaccine that's being given to a specific groups of people. Mm -hmm. So Mary, you make a good point. And um, it actually is something that, um, again, I've been paying attention to as well. Um, this is messaging. This is messaging because you know, the vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you know, is effective, you know, at a higher rate, 90% at preventing um, severe disease and hospitalization. And that's really what the, the main concern is, right? We want to prevent people from, you know, um, you know, getting the severe disease and suffering through it and, um, you know, um, being hospitalized. And I feel like, and this is the same messaging that, um, you know, kind of came out about the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Um, we have to be cl clear on what it is that, you know, the intention, you know, of the vaccine is so that people really can truly understand. Now, most people won't get an option as to what vaccine they want, right? You don't get an option, right? You go to a site, you're, you have access to the vaccine that is available to you at that site. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really important to just clarify that message um, because I think when we use that 60, I think it's like 66% or 70%, you know, effective first, people go like, that is a lesser. Why are you giving it to me? It's a lesser vaccine. But it is the, the important piece of that is, you know, you got to weigh all the risks, you got to weigh all the benefits, right? So there are some populations where getting out to get a two vaccine series is going to be a challenge. Think about our homeless population, right? Think about those in individuals that don't necessarily have like a stable um, place, like they move from place to place, right? And the vaccines being three weeks or four weeks um, apart, uh, that might create a challenge or someone who says, okay, I want to get vaccinated, get the first vaccine um, of the Moderna or the Pfizer and has like either you know, a severe reaction or, you know, they can't take the second vaccine. Um, you know, the single vaccine might be appropriate for some populations. We gotta, we gotta fix the messaging around um, how we communicate this to people because it will contribute to the mistrust. It will contribute to the um, sort of the decrease in vaccine uptake among these populations. So, um, you know, what I'd like to, to, to do, even when I was vaccinating people, I want to hear from them. How do you feel about this? I want them to, you know, if you're scared or nervous about it, I want to know. I want to know what questions you have. You know, it's really a, an opportunity to teach people and really talk about, well, what it is to take a vaccine. What is it doing to your body? Okay. Um, what to do if you do experience a negative, you know, um, effect or side effect or an adverse effect from the vaccine. Um, and just really spend that time engaging, you know, those populations that's going to, to need that and, and really, you know, make the messaging clear around that. Like, I, I get it, like them throwing, you know, the, the three different numbers, they, they threw three different numbers out there about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. I mean, you know, you hear 66 and you're like, 
that's not a good thing, right? You know, where I want the 99 or the 95% one. <laughs> but the, the, the goal is to prevent disease and prevent hospitalization. And it's like 90 something percent effective against, you know, those situations. Um, uh, Yang, I want to give you an opportunity to just chime in if you wanted to offer something. I think that, um, uh, Anisha, I, I totally agree with you. The messaging is very important, especially given the mistrust of the medical uh, community. Mary, I think that, um, because people most of the time don't read about how they come up with these uh, percentages. But basically yes. the Johnson Johnson vaccine, they did a global clinical trial that covers also South population in South Africa. So that's why that kind of like touch on the South African variants. Mm -hmm. While the Moderna and the, um, uh, what's the other one? Pfizer. Pfizer. They mm -hmm. only did clinical trial in the United States. Right. So those two vaccines, so if Johnson Johnson did the same thing as Moderna and Pfizer, they said that it could be just, you know, 90% plus. And because when people, when I looked at different epidemiologists study and their, their, their interview, and so then you, you kind of like get the, you know, like a better understanding. But most people, if they're not doing this, I'm teaching this. So that's why I, I try to get as much as information to my students, but most people don't do that. So that's why the messaging is so important. So great, that yeah. don't throw this percentage at them and say, these are, you know, efficient, you know, very effective. Talk to your physician about it and have some, you know, like very, you know, clear guidelines. So I think that now Moderna and Pfizer, they just started their global clinical trial. So mm -hmm. who knows when they come up, come back, right? Could be similar to what, you know, Johnson Johnson has. So that's just what I wanted to say. And messaging is very important. The health literacy is so important. And I constantly tell my students, you are the ambassador to your, your community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you learn these and you should educate your families, your communities. And so that's how we can reduce uh, these uh, racial disparities, mm -hmm. but I'm a strong advocate. I know the communication uh, training is important, but I'm a strong advocate of universal health care because that's the only way at least give people access because the, to, re you know, like reduce the impact of social determinants of health. So that's, mm -hmm. That's just my position. So. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, right? There's so many different out options. The, the healthcare conversation, the access to healthcare conversation is an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, with the, 20 to, the 2010 um, Affordable Care Act legislation, you know, try, with that attempt to make universal healthcare, the healthcare of the United States, we, we have to look at that. I mean, you know, we have to think about, you know, in order for people to be healthy, they need to be able to access the healthcare system no matter where they are in terms of socioeconomics, whether they have a job or not have a job. And our, the, the individuals who fall in that gap, you know, um, you know, after graduating high school, before you get a full time job that has health and health insurance, you know, protecting those the people's health, you know, in those healthy years, important. it's so important yeah. and making sure prevention is key. It, it does start at home. It does start in our communities. It does start where we live. And if we can get people on that, um, you know, you know, really focusing on prevention and health promotion, mm -hmm. um, we really can, you know, improve our outcomes, longevity, you know, all of that. Um, and then the other statistic, you know, in terms of uh, COVID-19 kind of shedding a light on a lot of these disparities, yeah. um, it's real. It, it's really something that, um, it's really something that is um, significant uh, in terms of how we message around this disease, right. how we engage that those populations, how we do outreach, right? We have we have um, vaccine distribution centers, right? Well, we know that that's not accessible for everybody. How are we going to do? Now we start to see mobile sites pop up. Yeah. Now we start to see interventions like, um, uh, you know, churches 
seeking mm -hmm. out the the um, support of churches and and religious leaders to um, you know encourage their congregation to you know get vaccinated. So we're seeing these attempts at addressing some of these disparities. But you know, I I it's frustrating sometimes because I think that's kind of late. <laughs> like we knew how to reach people. We know how to reach people. We know how to reach, you know, um, individuals in, in just about every ethnicity or culture. We know where people are and how we mm -hmm. reach them um, is definitely uh, should have been thought about. Right. We're not that we, you know, we should have been thinking about that ahead of time. Um, but we're doing it. You know, it's not perfect. We're doing it. And, and if I might just chime in one more time, it's just that I believe that as educators, it's our obligation to, you know, educate the future generation that healthcare is not the U.S. healthcare system is not the only system in the world. Oh and yeah, because we are the fee for service, and we should educate the future generation that healthcare is a human rights issue. You know, yes. if that's what we believe, that's what we should encourage people to vote to get. You know, like really change the system. It's a human rights yeah. issue. Sorry, I just yeah. I talk too much. It's I, politics. I you know, it's politics. It's it's all of that. You know, it's 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 very much not just you know treatment, right? It's beyond. It's really um, definitely a dynamic situation and conversation. But thank you. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Anisha. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, this is this has been great. It seems like it's such a huge topic, right? Access, communication, socioeconomic. Uh, and and you've been practicing for many years, teaching for many years. I'm just interested to know, like with COVID-19, what, what surprised you most? What did you learn? And by the way, uh, I hope everybody saw the article in the magazine about Anisha. <laughs> Your grant, uh, it was posted, <laughs> that it's posted, we haven't, actively um, put out the magazine yet, but the article was posted. Um, um, and, and your grandma was fun. Your that, grandma they, would be very so proud. That was fun. Oh, yes. that was fun. Thank you so much. I got yes. to really think about her when I did that. So that was awesome. I hope you all read it. Her grandmother's in there. But I mean, it's like, what was most surprising to you out of this whole COVID-19 uh, and for healthcare, I mean, it's a big question, but it's a big question. What was so surprising and what was so scary was in the beginning, in the beginning where we were not prepared and the amount of casualties. And then as it comes out, the death rate among our elders, um, it is so sad and you know i i love older people i i love older people and i feel like um they were not necessarily considered our workforce was not necessarily considered you know my mom is a home health aide she contracted COVID 19 working in the beginning you know her employer did not even tell her the risk like, you know, she puts her, li her life, we have first responders putting their life on the line for people, but not given the information that they need to protect themselves. So I, I was just really floored by the lack of preparedness and the just the, uh, the desire to just put it under the rug. And when it didn't go away, and they had to face it, it's when a lot of this information came out. Um, but I feel like um, this has given us an opportunity. I like to think of everything as an opportunity because this is not the last pandemic that we're going to experience. Um, this is really just an opportunity for us to see these gaps in our healthcare system. 
and identify, you know, those vulnerable populations to something like COVID-19 and put those safety guards and safeguards in place to protect the health of everyone. Um, you know, it, it was very scary. It was very draining. Um, just imagine the, um, the, the, the emotional fatigue that nurses experienced. And we did a lot of coaching with our students in the beginning of the pandemic because many of them were like nursing assistants and people on the front lines, scared to go into work, not knowing what PPE that they should have. And, you know, we did a lot of like, you know, re-educating and talking about infection control and prevention and how to keep yourself safe and making that a priority. If you can't, if you can't protect yourself, and if you can't um, be healthy, then you cannot show up for someone else. So it's it's not some we can't you know jump in front of a bus. We have to think about and you know and then the American Nurses Association pushes that a lot. Healthy nurse. We want the nurse. We want the workforce to be healthy. So um, making that a priority. But. Um, it has been interesting and um, it is definitely, we have areas for growth. I think another big lesson is to, you know, thinking about those vulnerable populations first rather than last, right? We had, we saw a lot of the outcomes and then we say, oh, we have to intervene, right? We're seeing, you know, um, the disparities going on, let's do something about it. But those things will still exist. So when we have these healthcare crises, we have to kind of have safeguards in place to protect those individuals who are most vulnerable and can't necessarily do it for themselves. I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in sort of thinking about this instead of just kind of paying attention to what is in front of us and dealing with it that way, um, thinking out and beyond that. Great, thank you. Thanks for the question, yeah. Well, Yang, you said it's a um, human rights issue, right? Healthcare, it's also a, a, in Catholic social teaching, right, Andre? <laughs> yeah. She's so I mean, yeah, um, yeah. I, the I also believe that it is about it's about social justice for me. I think everyone deserves right. the opportunity to have good health, right? And there's there you know we need to make that accessible to to everyone wherever they are. Um, we we have a lot of people that don't necessarily agree with that. There's a lot of people who believe that, hey, it's not going to be fair for everybody. It's not going to be equitable for everybody, you know, and um, they're willing to accept, you know, the, the the losses, the marginalization that comes with, you know, not having a system that is set up that is equal or equitable, right? So beyond equal, but equitable. Um, so, you know, it is something that is political. And we have to, you know, again, encourage our students, our young people, our nurses. You know, sometimes we get so busy with our day to day, we don't necessarily pay attention to those things. Um, but voting is important and making sure that your legislation and um, your legislators know what you want. Um, and if they aren't acting in your favor, then you use your power, your vote to kind of make that change. Um, so it is very political. And I know a, lo a lot of nurses don't want to get political, right? We just want to care for people. But um, we, we do have to kind of think about it, you know, in terms of those determinants. And, and policy is one of that, one of those things. Policy, health policy is a huge determinant of health. Great. Um, I'm looking at the, the hands on my screen. I don't see any more hands being raised. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I don't I don't know if there are any more questions. If there are, we can you know I think we can take like one or two more questions and then uh, for Nisha. Gonna take the silence to mean um, that everyone had their questions answered, which is good. Yeah, um, it's been a long day too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, man, uh, yeah, but thank you so much. This has been great. We've really enjoyed this. Um, thank you, Colette, for sharing the article about Anisha, um, which I'll be sure to read that. Um, and thank thank everyone again for um, for showing up so much. I'm sorry for showing up for our second installment of the anti-racism lecture series. We hope you'll join us next week. Um, the next week's discussion will be the legacies of apartheid in South Africa. So we're looking forward to that one as well. Um, so we'll be on back uh, next Monday, 5 o'clock, the same uh, same uh, Google Hangout Meet link. Again, thank you, Nisha, so much for taking on this this challenge, I'll say, right? right yeah. Of uh, how to uh, 